Matthew 10, verse 16 through 23, New American Standard Version, 1995. Behold, I send you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. So be as shrewd as serpents and innocent as doves. But beware of men, for they will hand you over to the courts and scourge you in their synagogues. And you will even be brought before governors and kings for my sake, as a testimony to them and to the Gentiles. But when they hand you over, do not worry about how or what you are to say, for it will be given you in that hour what you are to say. For it is not you who speak, but it is the Spirit of your Father who speaks in you. Brother will betray brother to death and a father his child, and children will rise up against parents and cause them to be put to death. And you will be hated by all because of my name. But it is the one who has endured to the end who will be saved. But whenever they persecute you in one city, flee to the next. For truly I say to you, you will not finish going through the cities of Israel until the Son of Man comes. So I've to sum up this section of... Matthew chapter 10, it would be that persecution is to be expected. You can expect persecution. You should expect persecution. Now, it's not a 100% guarantee you're going to face it. I know some of you, you lived your whole life for the Lord, and if you were to compare your persecution to what Jesus is saying here, then you haven't really faced this kind of persecution. And while you may not have experienced, and while it's somewhat uncommon to face such persecution here in America, still, for a disciple in Jesus, we're always to consider that as abnormal. Persecution should be expected. But do not be intimidated. Verse 16 through 20 teaches us this. Do not be intimidated. And verse 16, where I'm going to spend the bulk of our time this morning, is the key verse here. It's the verse that really teaches us and explains to us how we are to be in this world. Jesus starts off by describing us as sheep. He goes, Behold, I send you as sheep in the midst of wolves. Think about that. A sheep is completely defenseless. There's nothing a sheep can do to protect itself. It's helpless, defenseless, and it's also harmless. There's nothing a sheep can do really to harm others. You know, it may try, but it's more likely to fall on its back and end up squirming and, and crying for the shepherd. And that's how we are in this world. We're not to be these things with huge fangs, these these ravenous wolves that bite and, and destroy whatever comes at us, we are to be as, as harmless, innocent sheep. And Jesus says that he's sending us into the midst of wolves. Now can you imagine, just imagine this, just, just at the end of, of Matthew chapter 9, it says Jesus was seeing his sheep without a shepherd. And when he saw his sheep without a shepherd, he was moved deeply with compassion. because He's like, look at them. They're defenseless, they're helpless. He was mourning over that fact. They didn't, have, they didn't have leadership in their lives that cared about them. They were being consumed by false teachers and false leaders. He was mourning over that. But then here it says that he is sending them out into the midst of wolves. Now, why would the good shepherd send out sheep in the midst of wolves? Well, we know that he's the good shepherd, so we know and we can trust that the only reason he'd be taking us in the midst of wolves would be because we have to go through the midst of wolves. It's because it's necessary. It's because that has to happen. Because those wolves may someday be sheep. And the only way that we're going to make them sheep, that we're, gonna, that we're going to show them that there is a good shepherd, they don't have to live a life of bearing their teeth and being violent and evil, is by being in their midst. That puts us in a lot of danger. But we can trust that the good shepherd, the one who agonizes over the abuse his sheep endure, the one who would leave the 99 for the one, and who knows every sheep by name, would not send his sheep into the midst of the wolves unless he absolutely had to. So it's necessary. But he tells us, as he sends us out into the midst of these wolves, these wolves that are described in the other verses, which we'll get to, he wants us to be as wise as serpents. That's weird. Because today, we don't think of serpents as wise. We try to avoid serpents, typically. Uh, we don't think of them as wise. You know, we think of like owls being wise and foxes being crafty. But the ancients, when they thought of this, they got the picture of a serpent. If you remember in Genesis, in Genesis 3.1, it says, Now the serpent was more cunning 
than any beast of the field that the Lord God had made. Even God acknowledged that a serpent, something about them, makes them cunning, wise. And this is not a negative thing, actually. This is actually a kind of a, it's, it's a compliment. If you say somebody is crafty, now you could be saying they're crafty if they've done something bad, but you could also say they're crafty if they're able to avoid getting hurt, able to avoid harm, able to plan out their steps well. You could say that they're crafty, they're cunning, they're wise. It's kind of a neutral statement. Then the word in the Hebrew is arum. Can you say arum? Arum. You can do better than that. Arum. Okay. Now, this word, it's different than the typical word for, for wisdom, which is chakma, which means skill, which is kind of our typical way of thinking about wisdom. Arum has this, think of arum as like the firearm of wisdom. A firearm can be used to harm others and rob others, but it can also be used to protect and defend others. That's a room. It's a wisdom that can be both either harmful or, or it can be used in a positive sense to defend yourself. So it's that cunning. It's that neutral word. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 16, uh, Paul was talking about the complaint that the Corinthian church is raising up against him. The Corinthian church was accusing Paul of being a room of being cunning. They said, oh, we, we see right through you, Paul. You sent Timothy to collect money so that he could go and bring it to you so you could put it in your pocket. How very a room of you. So they were using it in a negative sense. Paul sets them straight. He goes, no, it's not what I'm doing. And I've been up front with the way I've used the money. And he, and he, and he goes and he corrects that. But there's a, there's a negative way of using the word. But it's also used several times throughout Proverbs. And clearly it's used here in a positive sense. It is used of, of a wise person. Proverbs 12, 16 says, A fool's anger is public, but an arum man holds back his disrespect. He holds back words that could ruin his reputation, words that could get him into trouble. And a arum man is not someone that struggles with foot and mouth syndrome. I struggle with foot and mouth syndrome sometimes. But an arum man does not. And so... Uh, you could say, to be as wise as serpents means having the ability to shut your mouth. <laughs> that's, that's one part of it. But Proverbs goes on and it talks about this. Proverbs 13, 16, it says, Every a room man acts with knowledge, but a fool lays open his foolishness. So the room man has done his research. He knows what he's talking about. He knows what he's doing. Whereas the, a foolish man walks about blindly. He makes choices, choices haphazardly. And there's Proverbs 14, verse 8 and 15. I'll read those for you. The wisdom of the Arum is to understand his way, but the folly of fools is deceit. The naive believes every word, but the Arum plans out his steps well. So an Arum person would also, is also a discerning person. They can discern deceit from truth. And that's so key. You know, I've got the question several times from people. How do you know that this is what is true? How do you know that the Bible is true? How do you know that you're not just the byproduct of your raising? For one thing, I wasn't raised Christian. But the big thing is you can discern truth. You find out truth by testing it. You find out truth by looking into it, by studying it out, by seeing if what it claims happened, happened. And so... When you reach that process, when you're that firm on truth, when you have discerned that it is true, you are as wise as a serpent. And so it's good. We should be able to cut through deceit. We should be wise and not easily tricked. So an arrogant person is able to discern. So they're able to keep their mouths shut and they're able to discern. But there, that's, there's one more thing I want to point out about someone who is a room. Proverbs 22.3 and 27.12 kind of makes this point. It says, And a room man foresees evil and hides himself. The naive continues ignorantly and are punished. So, you, so you get, I get this picture of the a room man's walking by, and then he sees a rope on the ground, and he knows if I step in that rope, I'm going to get caught in a trap. So he steps around it. Whereas the naive person, they just got their hands in their pocket, they're just, they're like, their eyes are closed, they're walking, they're whistling. And they walk right into the trap. 
That's, so there's a picture there. So a ring person can avoid harm. Now the reason a serpent is a good picture of a room is because a serpent, if you really think about it, is a pretty wonderful creature. Even Solomon noticed this. In all of his wisdom, he said, it's, it's what is some things that are too wonderful for me, one of them being the serpent on the rock. The way of the serpent on a rock is amazing. Because really think about it. Think about how ridiculous snakes are. They're such a ridiculous creature. If I were to tell you that there's this creature with no arms, no legs, no wings, you would not think that it would be the third most dangerous creature in the world. Snakes are the third most deadly predator for humans. Coming, coming behind ourselves, we do such a good job at hurting ourselves, and mosquitoes because of the diseases they carry. So snakes, with no arms and no legs, with no bark really, besides a very few species who have like maybe a rattle or something, they're such subtle creatures, but they are so deadly. They are not something to be taken lightly. And though they have no arms, no legs, no wings, they get around very well. They get around very fast. You see them on a rock, they can get up a rock with just their muscles and get themselves climbing almost, almost directly up a rock at a 90 degree angle. They traverse the ground very well. So in that sense, when you think that a snake is so silent, it's so, if you think about it, modest in that way. Though it's so deadly, when you see it, you don't immediately think, that thing's going to kill me unless you know what it is and what it can do. When you know that its, it's strength to wrap around and strangle is so great. That is the picture of the wise serpent. The little ninja sticks of death. But they're modest, meek, humble, subtle. These are how we are supposed to be. We're supposed to be modest and meek and humble and subtle. We're not supposed to intimidate everybody around us. We're not supposed to walk about intimidating people. And so the point of this is we should take these positive qualities of the serpent and not the bad ones. We're not to be poisonous. We're not to be toxic. We're not to be burying our fangs at people. Or to be as wise as serpents. But as innocent as doves. Doves were considered clean. And um, they were commonly used and sacrifices. Because a dove was considered this, this, clean, uh, this clean animal. And so its, it's clean blood was spelt to cover your uncleanness before the Lord in ancient Israel. And so we're to be as innocent as doves. The word there is interesting. It's the word not mixed. That's what it literally means. Not mixed. And so you get this picture. Something that is not mixed is pure. It's undefiled. It is one thing. It is what you think it is. And so that's how we are to be. We are to be purely the Lord's. Romans 16, 19 says, be wise. This is a different word for wise. This is a general word for wise. So be wise concerning good. But be innocent concerning evil. Be not mixed concerning evil. So this is, there's this thing where we're called to be, I mean, you couple this with a room, what it simply means is we're called to be innocent, but not gullible. We're called to be innocent, but not easily fooled and tricked. Innocent, but discerning. Innocent, but able to avoid harm. Innocent, but not open-lipped. So the picture here is, when you think about it, though, well, how are you supposed to be not easily gullible if you haven't been around the block a couple of times? It's, because there, there's that picture, right? If you want to know that something's a fake, then you've got to study all the fakes, right? But fakes continue to be reproduced. Evil continues to, to find new creative ways to get around. And if you want to be evil, if you want to be deceitful, oh, you'll do it. We are very good at that. You ever tried to, you ever tried to ground your kid or take things away from your kid or punish your kid? But what, or, or you uncover something about your kid and so then you, you put rules in place to try to keep them from being sneaky? But then they only get smarter. They only get better at hiding things from you. We are very good at doing that. Maybe some of you, that was you as a teenager. And so that was just uh, it coming back around when you had your own kids. But the picture is, we are very good at being sneaky and tricky. But that's not what we are to be. 
I like this uh, company's way of going about things, and I, and I think most of you have heard this, but let's apply it here. This company, where their way of being able to discern counterfeit money from real money was they studied real money very well. They handled only real money, and they, and they studied it every little detail so that they knew if something was off, they'd go right away. Now that is the best way to gain wisdom. Study what is true and zone in on what is true and discern what is true and focus on what is true. You don't need to know all the number of things that aren't true. You only give yourself, you only give yourself vertigo doing that. And so here's, here's what was uh, told me. The three, there's three types of ways to gain wisdom, right? There's the first way. You can learn from your own mistakes. You know, so if you make a mistake, as we all do, learn from it. You know, never make the same mistake twice. And if you do make it twice, then let that be a, a note not to do it the third time. Catch on to your mistakes and learn from them. So that's one way to gain wisdom. Another way to gain wisdom is to learn from others' mistakes. And so that's also good. You see somebody else make a mistake, then don't go and try it yourselves. Men, we're notorious for this, aren't we? Have you tried this? Yeah. What do we do? We go and we do it too. <laughs> we can't resist. So we don't learn from others' mistakes very well. That's a typical man thing that you... Um, and there's the third way of gaining wisdom, which is much better than having to learn from your mistakes and others' mistakes, and that is trusting and obeying the Lord the first time. Knowing the truth, knowing what is right, knowing what the Lord has called you to do, and doing it. And hopefully, throughout time, you have learned from not doing that to start doing that. And then you're going to avoid numerous mistakes in the future by doing that. And so that's what Romans 16, 19 is all about. Be wise concerning good. Spend all of your time discerning what is good and be innocent concerning evil. Let yourself not be mixed up with evil. You don't need it. Philippians 2, 15 is a great, um, is a great verse as well for us. It's in the context of, the, of us as believers when we start to get in a, in a spirit of complaining and we start to fight with each other. It says, don't complain and don't fight so that you may be blameless and innocent sons of God without rebuke in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation among whom you shine as lights. Our innocence is a testimony. You know, you ever heard somebody's testimony and they've been through a lot of stuff. They had a rebellious stage from the Lord and their testimony is wild and is entertaining and it's fascinating. And you may get discouraged. My testimony isn't nearly that powerful. Innocence and following the Lord your life is a testimony. When you can show what a life is like that has been following the Lord and how that has been what and how that has guided you and how it has not steered you wrong, that is a testimony. A powerful one at that. So your testimony is at risk, though, when you get into a spirit of complaining and we start fighting with each other. I hear about people who leave the church. You know, I'm sure in this church's history there's people like that, and in other churches there's people like this. And maybe, maybe it's us, where, where after a while you eventually are going to have an issue with somebody. It's going to happen because we're people and we all have different opinions and we all have different personal convictions. So after a little while, if you're living together and you're living in close quarters, which we should be as a church, we should be close, you're going to start to step on toes every now and then. And your toes are going to be stepped on, expected. That should be expected, even more so than persecution. Because all the time I, I, I hear, and it breaks my heart, I know it breaks God's heart when he sees the church divide, when a, when a couple or a family or, or, or friends have a disagreement, they step on each other's toes for the first time, and they just leave. Just like opposite magnets, they just bounce off of each other and both leave the church. I hate to see that. So expect to get your toes stepped on and expect to step on each other's toes. Put aside your opinions. Put aside your personal convictions. Notice I'm separating personal conviction from biblical conviction and love one another. Esteem others as greater than yourselves. Don't get so caught up in fighting that you ruin your testimony. That you break the innocence and your blamelessness and your light goes dim before the world. The world's not going to know its truth 
I'm not going to know what is true if we're bickering over our differences. So we must be unmixed. We must be innocent. We must be heartless children of God. Let us be lovey-dovey serpents. Let us be tactful and true. Let us be silent. You know, you know that saying, silent but deadly? But let us be silent and life-giving. Silent and life-giving. Let us become cunning, yet good. So if I were to wrap up verse 16, I would say it's all about being shrewd, but being true. And then verse 17 through 23 is all about being bruised. And verse 17 it talks about the kind of physical sufferings and shame that we will suffer for Jesus. You know, verse 17, it talks about, uh, it tells us to be wary of men. And we should be. Nobody is completely trustworthy. We shouldn't expect anybody to, to hold us up in complete perfectness all the time. If we give each other that kind of trust, that is a wrong type of trust to give your fellow man. That is a trust that you only give to the Lord. Only the Lord can truly hold you up without telling you. If, you. if you give that kind of trust to anybody, even a brother in Christ, you will be let down. If you put that kind of trust in me, I will let you down. I'll forget something. I'll, I'll forget your name. You all know I've done that several times. Um, but don't put that kind of trust in men. Be wary of men in that sense. But also be wary especially of those who mean you harm. That's part of being being as wise as serpents. We should be able to discern who is there to harm us and who is being receptive of us. It says, for certain men will hand you over to courts. So there's Jewish government that they're handing you over toward, and they'll scourge you in their synagogue. Scourging was the pain, the suffering that Jesus endured when they tied his hands to a post. And they grabbed this leather whip and they tarred it and they put different pieces of glass and bone in it and they whipped him. And you received 39 different lashings. Some on the face, some on the back. It was a gruesome punishment. It's something that Paul went through five different times for Jesus. Because he was trying to tell people about Jesus. And yet he was taken by men delivered to their courts, and then scourged in the Jewish gathering places. Places that were meant to be upholding the word of God and teaching them, and yet, as a man is trying to teach the word of God, he was scourged. Several throughout history. Now, scourging in this day may look a bit different, but we have our own kinds of scourging, our own kinds of persecution that we may have to face for Jesus. We should expect it. If we're going to be bold for Christ, if we're going to live for him, we should expect that we're going to face some, some hard times. Verse 18 goes on. It says, You'll be brought before governors, before kings, for my sake, as a testimony to them and to the Gentiles. So, as, so also see this. See, persecution, though it is to be expected, it is also an opportunity. Persecution is an opportunity. The more angry people are, the more people try to go against you, the more opportunity that gets you. When people question you out of, out of anger or whatever else, there's a chance for you to give an answer. When scripture says, be willing to give an answer to anybody that asks of you, what that means, it's kind of a picture of persecution. When you are persecuted, when they drag you off and they ask you why you are the way you are, why you believe what you believe, you should be able to answer them and give an account and proclaim Jesus boldly to them. That's the way of a disciple of Jesus as we walk in a world that is perverse and crooked. But don't be dismayed. Don't, don't get so wrapped up with what am I going to say. If you truly believe in Jesus, if you truly have a faith in him, if you know why you believe, then trust him. You have the Holy Spirit in you, and he is there to empower you in the moment of persecution. Corrie ten Boom, when she was a kid, you know, when she was a kid, before she went through the horrible things that she went through at the hands of Nazi Germany. But when she started to find out about people who were dying, Christians who died for their faith, she asked her father, she goes, Father, I don't know if I can endure that. I don't know if I could have a firm faith in the midst of persecution. How do people do that? And her, and her father looked at her and very wisely he said, Corey, when do I give you money for the train? 
Do I give it to you before you get on? After you get on? Good. I mean, do I give it to you months in advance or anything? He goes, no, I give it to you when you need it. So that is the same way with the Lord. That's exactly what it says here in verse 20. Or verse, let's go verse 19. But when they hand you over, do not worry about how or what you are to say, for it will be given you in that hour what you are to say. For it is not you who speak, but it is the Spirit of your Father who speaks in you. So don't go scrambling around and trying to make this elaborate defense. I've tried that so many times with people. I've tried to come up with, with really creative ways to try to, try to work, work the gospel into them. But the times that have been most effective have just been regular conversations on the spot where God has prompted me to say things. And yes, it may not have been the most eloquent thing I've ever spoken, but it was personal and it was true and it connected. Trust the Holy Spirit to empower you to be able to share the gospel. If you would just step out in faith, if you would just walk up to that person, let's just move this beyond persecution, if you just walk up to that person you've been praying for and you would just start speaking to them, trust the Holy Spirit to give you the words to speak. Trust the Holy Spirit. Just say, Lord, equip me now. Here I go and go. Just the same as, as we're expecting in the midst of persecution. When they come at you and they try to ask you, don't try to come up with some elaborate tricky way to, to deceive them or whatever else or, or, or wax eloquent, just speak the truth and the Holy Spirit speak for you. Let God's purposes be done for you. That is what he is telling us. So we will face persecution. It is to be expected. And we will face many sufferings and shames at the hands of many wolves, people who mean us harm, people who want to hurt us. Our kinsmen, our families, as it tells us in verse 21 through 23, when we face persecution at the hands of our fathers and our sons and our brothers, when we will be hated by all kinds according to Jesus' name, know that no one can truly harm us. I'm going to get more into that next week. But know that verse 23, but whenever they persecute you in one city, flee to the next, for truly I say to you, you will not finish going to the cities of Israel until the Son of Man comes. What this tells us is persecution will continue. It should be expected in the church until one of three things happens. Until either you die, until either you flee from the persecution, which then you may face persecution elsewhere, or until Christ returns. So you may die in that moment. You may manage to escape and live on and carry the gospel, and Christ may return. But either way, we are to be bold in our faith, and we are to continue forward, wise as serpents, innocent as doves, to reach this community, to reach this country for Christ. What do you say? All right. Let's pray. Father, Thank you for your word. And there are certain things I didn't get to cover. But God, it's because your word is so rich. There's so much to it. But God, I just pray for my brothers and sisters as they sat under your word here for this time. Lord, that you would just work it into their hearts. God, that you would teach them what it truly means to be a wise yet innocent. Truly, truly know what it means to trust in you as the good shepherd as we as your sheep walk into the midst of wolves. Help us, Lord, to trust you, both, Lord, for the courage and the boldness, but also for the words. God, help us to discern what is true. Help us, Lord, to keep our mouth shut when opening it would only cause more harm than good. And God, help us to be wise in avoiding harm, but, Lord, not so cowardly that we refuse to give your gospel, that we refuse to be bold, that we don't try to avoid persecution but that we understand that it is coming, Lord. So we need your boldness, we need your strength, we need your Holy Spirit. And we pray for this. And we pray for it in Jesus' name, for Jesus' purposes and mission. Amen. Thank you.